YouTube first. Woohoo! All right. Welcome, YouTube audience. We are still working on getting our LinkedIn Live uh, kicked in. And once we do that, then we'll kick off the show. So just give us a couple more minutes. All right. So just give us a couple more minutes. All right. It's a little Hello. bit of echo. Yeah, there's an echo, echo, echo here. <laughs> Okay. okay, I think we're all set on uh, LinkedIn as well. So Denny, just sending over the, uh, the LinkedIn link for you now. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, give us one more minute to get all ourselves all configured and set up. And once we do, then we will start the show. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Welcome to this awesome session in which we've got multiple panels, as you can see from this uh, panel view that we have today. Uh, just in case you're wondering, we are part of the From Tahoe to Delta Lake. We are Somacast on Zoom. YouTube and LinkedIn all at the same time. So I'm gonna start off to explain what the session is and then we'll do a quick round of introductions and then we're gonna dive right into the AMA. So be prepared with your questions. We're gonna be looking at all three platforms for your questions. So let's give it a start. All right, so <clears throat> for starters, let me go ahead and show the slides. That would be extremely helpful to all of us here. All right, ta -da. there we go. And uh, just confirming to my esteemed colleagues that you can see the slides correctly. Looks good. Correct. All right. Well, again, from Tahoe to Delta Lake, there's a reason we call it Tahoe to Delta Lake. You're going to find out very soon shortly. Okay. So, but before we dive into it, I want to call out there are always upcoming online events with the Data and AI Meetup. You can check us out at meetup.com slash data dash AI dash online. Uh, you can subscribe to us at our Databricks YouTube channel, or you can follow us on the Databricks LinkedIn. So please, we're, we're in a lot of different locations, so you can definitely check us out. Uh, the next thing we wanted to call out is this Thursday, we have the Data and AI Online Meetup Community Lightning Talks. In preparation for the upcoming Data and AI Summit next week, we have four awesome speakers, okay? Uh, Franco Patana, uh, Shivanji uh, Sviestava, uh, Alyssa Vizhnik, and Yang Zhang, uh, where they're gonna be talking about their various components of data engineering and data science. So really cool stuff as a good preparation or call out to the Data and AI Summit, which of course, call it, oh, of course, I skipped the slide, my apologies. I did also wanna call it before talking about the Data and AI Summit, uh, Data Brew by Databricks. Uh, it is a shameless plug for a podcast, bitcast series for myself and Brooke Winnig. Uh, this last season, we were talking a lot about lake houses, which also featured, by the way, uh, Michael Armbrust, who's here today. <laughs> and also a, uh, a call out to uh, Mate Zaharia, who does episode one for ML in production. We actually have multiple sessions already. So check us out here. Go to data uh, data-brew.io or that link there. And you can listen to us also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. <clears throat> now I can go and talk about Data and AI Summit. It's next week. Uh, first two days is training, three days of keynotes and awesome sessions. 200 plus highly technical sessions. And we've got a lot of cool people uh, uh, featured here. So please register today. We'd love to see you there. Most of us that you are hearing uh, on today's session are actually going to be there as well. So definitely be on the lookout for us. All right. So without further ado, that's it for the last slide. So we're going to go from Tahoe to Delta Lake. So uh, I'm going to stop presenting and... We're gonna go right into questions. So if we have any questions, put like I said, put them on Zoom, put them on LinkedIn or put them on YouTube, okay? Uh, the, ki qui the kick, the kick, yeah, the, excuse me, the key call out that I wanna say is that obviously we wanna talk about things that are related to Delta Lake and Tahoe. Um, so in order for us to kick it off, let's do a quick round of introductions. So I'm gonna just base it off of the my window so I can keep track here. Let's start with you, Barack. I uh, want you to do a quick intro of yourself. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brock. I'm a <clears throat> soft fleet, uh, software, uh, software engineer at Databricks. 
and I've been working on Delta for quite a while now, essentially. Yeah. In the stream team. Yeah. I think you've been working on it a while. Yes, that's right. Fair, perfect. QP, why don't you introduce yourself, buddy? Hi, I'm QP. I'm an engineer from Squid. Uh, I've been working with Tyler um, and um, Christian and other Squid engineers on um, the Rust implementation of Delta Lake. Excellent, excellent. Love that stuff. All right, Tyler, you're next on the line. So introduce yourself, please. I'm uh, our Tyler Croy. I'm the director of platform engineering at Scribd, and I contribute when possible to Delta RS and Kafka Delta Ingest, and do a lot and lot a lot of Delta like stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And the next on my screen will be Ryan. Ryan, want you to introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Ryan, and uh, basically, I'm software engineer from Databricks, and uh, working like with. Uh, Brock and uh, in the same team. And uh, basically in the past several years, I have been working on like Delta and structured streaming. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ryan. That's awesome. All right, next in line, TD. Want to introduce hey, everyone. Hey everyone, also software engineer in Databricks, working with uh, Ryan Borak, Michael on Delta and structured streaming for quite a while. Excellent. And then last, but certainly not least, Michael, why don't you do a quick introduction? Hi, I'm Michael. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. I am also an engineer at Databricks, and along with many of the people on this channel, we've helped create uh, Spark SQL, Structured Streaming, and Delta. Excellent. Well, then, by the way, for everybody, uh, please put in your questions, especially if you have any for Michael or TD, just because they're going to be here for about another seven to eight minutes before they have to run off to yet another pre-summit event. So. Uh, let me start off with you, Michael, first, since, you know, obviously, boom. Um, <clears throat> how did you even conceive the idea of Delta Lake in the first place? Like, what are some of those ideas that led to the evolution of Delta Lake? And may maybe perhaps even talk about some of the shortcomings of Spark that actually led to that evolution in the first place. Yeah, great question. So, you know, Delta really started with structured streaming. So at the kind of setting the context, me, Ryan, Barack, TD, we're all on a team at Databricks called the Stream Team. And we were kind of tasked with reimagining what streaming should look like inside of Spark. Uh, we knew that Spark streaming was pretty popular, but it also had a bunch of limitations. It didn't support event time. Uh, you couldn't change your queries and recover. Uh, there were some scalability problems when you were working with state. And so, you know, our mission was reimagine what streaming should be like inside of Spark and really make it kind of a first class part of Spark SQL. And of course, a really important part of that was streaming to files stored on S3. And as you can imagine, at the time, S3 was eventually consistent. So that was a pretty difficult problem to build a system that was guaranteeing exactly one semantics on top of this eventually consistent file system. And so if you look at the file sync inside of Apache Spark and you squint, it'll actually look quite a bit like Delta. It has this idea of a transaction log. It tracks files that are valid in any given version. It even has uh, nascent unused support for removing files that have been added to the transaction log. But it also has a whole bunch of limitations. It stores all of those files in memory. It supports only a single writer. Um, it has no concept of transactions or uh, conflict resolution or anything like that. And so, you know, after we kind of put it out there, we realized everybody who was using streaming, this was like the most popular sync for them to, uh, to be working with. And so, you know, then a couple of years later, after it started to get popular, I was at a Spark Summit and I met somebody who wanted to use structured streaming at a Fortune 10 company to ingest trillions of records per day and petabytes of data per week. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a really good challenge, but there is no way the open source file sync is going to handle that. And so we had been talking for a couple of months about this idea of a scalable transaction log and what it would be like. And so we really kind of took those lessons that we learned from building the, the, the first version inside of Apache Spark and, and came up with the, the Delta transaction protocol. That's really cool. So then <clears throat> this is more open to anybody, but, uh, but thank you very much for that context, Michael. But then is why... Tahoe. What 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 was the code name Tahoe before we ever called this Delta Lake? Because the, by the way, for everybody to provide context, the reason the session's called from Tahoe to Delta Lake is because that's actually the original code name for this project. And so there's been a lot of things that happened between the original now code name I to where it. we are now. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, go. that is that that naming is my fault. When I so I came back from this Spark Summit and I was like 
so excited about this. I like, I really wanted to build this thing. And I, I thought it would be really cool if we could do it. So I, I sat down and I built a prototype and I opened up a pull request. And just to like, you know, when you're working in an organization, it's important to figure out how to propagate your meme <laughs> if you want your ideas to be, to be big. And I think uh, marketing is an important part of that. So I named the pull request Project Tahoe. And I included this detail that I, I had learned recently. And I, you know, I'd been spending a bunch of time. Tahoe is a lake in California, for those of you who aren't like super up on Californian uh, geometry or geography. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of skiing and other things. So I had actually been spending a bunch of time up there. A lot of the, the Spark SQL uh, catalyst optimizer, like nested columns were implemented in a cabin in Tahoe. Uh, so it has a near and dear, like to my heart. Uh, but the reason I picked that name was Tahoe is an absolutely massive lake. And I was trying to build an absolutely massive data lake. Tahoe is so large that it, it's actually not that large, but it's incredibly deep. And it has so much water in it that if you were to spread it out evenly over the entire state of California, it would still be over a foot deep, which I think is like a pretty crazy amount of water. And I just thought that was really cool. And so I, I included that in the, the first opening PR description. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So there we go. Now you have the context. And so we got some other questions coming in, but I did want to add one for TD just because I know both TD and Michael are going to be going. So from your perspective, since, uh, you know, TD, since you've been doing all, all you, you know, a little bit about streaming, you know, last time I checked. So I'm just curious, how does, how does Delta Lake actually solve those streaming scenarios that, you know, that we couldn't solve before? Because after all, you could, you know, streaming was pretty cool, right? So what, what did Delta Lakes help solve here? So as Michael said that uh, the, the Apache Spark's file stream sync solved pieces of the problem of writing out files from a structured streaming query into, a, into some sort of cloud storage or distributed storage, but it had major limitations in terms that you could not, uh, you could not write from multiple streams to the same location, or you could not combine streaming writers and bad job writers to the same location, same table using anything that was present out there. So that's why this, when Michael designed this Delta protocol, the Tahoe protocol, it was kept in mind that there were going to be multiple writers that are going to concurrently write, be it streaming, be it batch, uh, be it, uh, so it was designed so that you can uh, handle multi concurrent rights with asset guarantees uh, and the whole thing can scale. So from streaming point of view, this expanded on the kind of use cases you could use, uh, uh, you, can, you could use structure streaming with, for example, be it multiple streaming queries up in the same table or, uh, streaming query generating uh, key value data you want to upsert into a delta table into a location that delta table gave you the ability to do merge and, and upserts into it so all of that use cases that was not possible before with a more managed uh, layout format like delta it just became possible so yeah it just it was a no brainer Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. So, Michael TD, I realized that you guys need a jet right now, so I'm going to let you guys go right now, so that way you know you can do your next thing. So, again, Michael TD, thank you very much for joining. Uh, we have still plenty of experts so for uh, for you to view, so keep on asking your questions. Um, so, I'm going to go switch gears. Um, uh, and by the way, for the people who are already asking questions on LinkedIn and YouTube and uh, wherever else, uh, keep on asking them. We will answer them. So. All right. Take care, Michael. Take care, TD. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So uh, meanwhile, let me go ahead and jump into the next set of questions here. Okay. Can so, I Brock, color to TD's answer as well? A absolutely. By all means, go for it. Yeah. I, I think there's also another interesting thing around like streaming workloads, specifically with Delta, is that, you know, streaming workloads have this inherent trade-off between latency and throughput. Like, do you wanna be able to access your latest data as soon as possible? Or do you wanna be able to query your table, you know, as efficiently and as effectively as possible? So this, you know, inherent latency where you wanna be like providing the access to the latest data, you need to write data as soon as possible. That means you don't get to write out large files. And um, 
you know, this problem with like cloud object stores is that if you don't write out large files, you have this like hit uh, in terms of query performance where you need to open up a lot of connections to read those files. And your queries like uh, over time get slower and slower. So one of the also cool things about Delta was that you could do, you know, uh, compactions on your data as a, you know, different writer than your original like streaming writers or your, you know, batch writers. And um, this compaction can at least, you know, improve your performance. And, you know, that was also a key thing that we looked at um, when we we're designing like the Tahoe protocol, essentially. Awesome stuff. Thank you very much for that context, Barack. Really appreciate it, man. So uh, let me go to the next question then, actually. So Tyler, I'm going to target this question to you, if that's okay. Um, yes. From your pers perspective, you know, why was Delta Lake necessary? Like, what problems did it solve for you, actually? Um, I actually didn't know about Delta Lake until mid 2019 when a bunch of people went to spark and ai summit and came came back like oh my gosh delta lake oh my gosh delta lake let's we need to use delta lake um we were actually planning a move from an on-premise infrastructure to aws in s3 and probably the number one thing that delta lake solved for us kind of out of the box was this question of consistency um aws s3 has gotten a lot better in the last couple of years becoming more consistent but it is still fundamentally uh, an eventually consistent uh, um, API. And what people would do is they'd deploy like S3 Guard or, or other things to where you could have different, different readers and writers working with data in S3. And Delta Lake just disappeared all of those problems, which was pretty, pretty nice. Um, we're also looking at uh, streaming use cases and batch use cases. And so we were planning like, uh, all right, our streaming job, they're going to talk to Kafka and then they're going to put data over here. And our batch jobs are going to go mess with data over here. And because we can have batch jobs and streaming jobs both reading and writing from Delta Lake tables uh, simultaneously effectively, it also unified the, the data layer quite a bit to where everything, everything sort of comes into Delta Lake and goes out of Delta Lake. There's no sort of separate data streams in the data platform anymore. Um, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Then related to this, which I know Tyler, you're uh, integrally involved with, but I definitely want to have QP kick it off first, uh, which you would have asked me to do anyways, uh, which is, um, so why did you decide to then support the Delta, like Delta Rust API? Right. Uh, how did what did was it intended to solve when you now that you're using Delta Lake, but then you wanted to basically build the Rust API to go with it? So, like, yeah, why did you do it? What what's the the secret sauce and magic behind it, QB? So, um, as Squid, we do have um, a lot of other type of consumers, uh, Delta Lake, potential Delta Lake consumers. Um, for example, we have a lot of a lot of Ruby um, code code base. We have a Python code base, um, and um, a lot and go, go code base as well. So all of these, uh, they won't be able to access Delta Lake um, because we're not running a JVM, we're not running in Spark. Um, so the, one, the initial idea that Tyler and I came, came up with is to see if you can support um, non-Spark consumers outside um, in, um, for Delta tables so that um, we can basically expand the, um, the, 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 the scope of uh, Delta Lake within script and um, make it more accessible to other applications. So um, this also for, my, for myself, it's sort of, it's like a learning project for me. Um, this seems to be the trend for a lot of Rust projects where, for example, the um, official AWS SDK for Rust was started as a learning project for the original maintainer. Now it's one of the official projects. So for me, it's more, it's also like, oh, wow, we're using Delta at script. Maybe I should learn more about this um, thing. So I spent um, weekends hacking on this um, and got it working in Rust, and that eventually becomes some uh, production ready um, library that we, um, we will be using as script, and it's already been used in other companies as well. Perfect. Thank you, you very much, Keith. The original oh. idea, like I had pitched the original idea in April of last year, and then QP, like this wasn't, I didn't ask QP, like, hey, do you think we could start working on this or anything like that? 
I almost feel like I nerd sniped them to where I was like, oh, there's going to be a lot of engineering work to do this Delta implementation. Then QP goes and reads the protocol and the protocol it's open, uh, it's under Delta IO uh, in the Delta repository. The protocol is not that complex. It's actually like, I had actually never spent the time to look at it. Um, and it's definitely worth a read for anybody doing you know, non-trivial work on top of Delta, like just to understand what, what actually happens underneath the covers. Um, because like Delta Lake is not my SQL. It's not, uh, it's not, you know, a database, but the behaviors that you, you get comfortable with on Delta Lake can be informed by understanding the actual protocol and what goes into the Delta transaction log. Perfect. Thanks very much, Tyler. Um, all right. Let me actually target as a question to Ryan because Ryan's actually been quiet. And that's not a good thing, buddy. So uh, I'm just yeah, curious, sure. like, you know, uh, from the perspective of other systems connecting to Delta Lake. So we just asked QP and, uh, and Tyler about like, you know, using other languages like Rust and uh, for, all, for those folks that don't know, because of the Rust binding, uh, the Rust API, you, it also has Python bindings and soon we'll have Golang and Ruby, I believe, right? So, <clears throat> so but the context is that basically it allows other, your, your programming language of choice. But then the question I'm gonna naturally ask to you, which of course is, a tad bit leading here, you know, how about other uh, systems, like whether it's your Presto, your Hive, or your Thenas, like how do they connect to Delta Lake, right? As, because it's not just about Spark anymore. As much as, you know, mm -hmm. we love Spark, the, the fact is data is sitting with all sorts of other systems that all need access Delta Lake. So how, how, how's that solved? I'm just curious, right? Yeah, so currently Delta actually have like a Hive connector. You can use Hive read the Delta tables. And uh, in addition, we also build uh, like a Delta standalone reader, which you can read a Delta table without a Spark. So anyone can use this library to like build a connector for other systems. So for Presto, currently we have a spatial integration, like manifest files, which is kind of, we generate a list of files belong to the table and then tells Presto to read. So basically, and uh, we also have like an open source pull request, try to use like the Hive connector to read uh, Delta tables in Presto. And uh, we are still working on this one and hope we can make this work soon. Yeah. Excellent, thanks very much. Okay, so we have a whole slew of questions coming yeah. in from LinkedIn, YouTube, and um, so let me go ahead and start trying to like pull some of those questions in and this will be open to all of us. So feel comfortable to just chime in uh, whenever you want, okay? So one of the first questions, I'm um, pulling this from LinkedIn. Um, is there a benefit of creating a data frame from a Delta table rather than the table created from Parquet files? You know, it, what, what is the benefit for basically pulling that? And this is from Shoab. Uh, Mohammed, I, I, hopefully I said your name correctly. My apologies if I did not, but hopefully we will be able to answer your question shortly. So yes. Okay. Anybody want to tackle that? Yeah, I, I can answer this. So it's basically Perfect, means right. reading a data frame from either a Delta or a packet format like this. So when That's you right, use yeah. like when you try to use like a data frame API to load a, a packet table using Spark, Spark will need to like the info packet file schema and also need to like a list of files in your table. And then, for example, when your table is very large, this will become very slow. And for Delta, we have everything in the transaction log. We can just use Spark itself to read this transaction log. This means reading transaction log is also itself. We are use of all of your cluster resource to speed up. So, and then we can quickly figure out which file we should read. And then we can just return all of the metadata queries will be very fast. So it's safer and faster, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But basically, yeah, you should always use Delta Lake. Yeah. Great yeah. wrap up, QP. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. Could not yeah. have said it better myself. <laughs> All right. Next question, again, from LinkedIn in this case. Uh, does Delta Lake take care of upserts automatically for, the ba for the, your batch files? And so I believe this question, question is more. Yeah. So, uh, Tyler, since you love it, go for it. <laughs> Oh, I'm not the right person to answer that. No, 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 not me. Someone that knows something. 
I just think it's oh. really impression. I'd like to know the oh, okay, answer cool. too. Okay, cool. All right. Well, <laughs> then, the, then the other people on the panel, what, what do you, uh, anybody want to chime in on your thought process concerning um, does Del Delta Lake take care of upsert automatically for batch files? Yeah. Okay, so Delta supports a merge operation that, you know, you can use to actually perform upserts on your table. So, you know, this is like a very standard SQL syntax to actually say, hey, you know, I want to merge my source data into my target table. Here's my like key condition. You give like a join, a join condition on, you know, what you want to match things on. And basically it has kind of like when it's matched, you can update when it doesn't match, you can insert, you can also delete when it's matched as well. So, um, you know, Delta supports, you know, upserts or merges through the syntax. Um, on top of that, you know, the way it works is essentially it does kind of like a copy on write semantic where, you know, we can read the files, change the records that need to be changed or updated, and then write the files back out again. And that's kind of like how uh, Tahoe's like protocol works, Delta's protocol works, because, you know, files are essentially immutable. You can't go and like change the records in them and then overwrite them. Uh, you want to keep like immutable copies of them so that you can also uh, support multi-versioned uh, concurrency control. Awesome. Thank you very much, Barack. Okay. One more from LinkedIn before I switch to the other uh, other forums. And uh, I believe somebody had asked this because it wasn't from us, even though it says it's from us, <laughs> was can I read Delta without Spark? Can I use a single node just to read it? Is Delta coupled with Spark? I'm definitely gonna be targeting QP or Tyler to answer that question. I'll let Tyler <laughs> speak first. Ah, oh, you stinker. Pew. You take it. Uh, so with Delta RS, uh, you, you don't need Spark anymore to read um, to read Delta Lake. There's also a Java standalone reader as well um, for reading Delta Lake. Um, on top of Delta RS, there's a Python binding. So if you can use this right now, if you do a pip install Delta Lake, you'll be able to use from your you know single local machine or or a single machine in in, in a cloud provider access a Delta table. And uh, the Python binding is actually really cool. There's a contributor named Florian who did a lot of the work there. The, that Python binding allows you to take a Delta table and just convert it into a pandas data frame. And so if you're already comfortable doing some amount of data processing in Python natively, um, you can just take a Delta table and turn it into a pandas data frame and start querying, uh, which is pretty cool. So yeah, it's Delta Lake's not just for Spark anymore. Thank you very much, Tyler. QP, or for that matter, Ryan and Barack, anything else you'd like to add? That looks, that, um, that's pretty accurate. I, I would just say that um, for, for, any, for things that fits into a single machine, like for example, quick development purpose, um, you, that using Delta RS or Python binding, that's definitely um, a good use case. Um, for like serious production workload, large amount of data script. Got it. Thanks very much, QP. Okay, cool. Let's switch over. We have a, another, a one question from YouTube. So let me go ahead and do that. And the question is, is Delta Lake now supported over GCS? Uh, anybody would like to take that? Or I can take it for that matter as well. So just want to ask that question first. Why don't you take you, it? Then? Yeah, you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the quick answer to that question is then, um, yes, Delta Lake actually works over Google Cloud Storage. It actually worked even before we introduced uh, Databricks on Google. So the fact is that you could always uh, already hit Google Cloud Storage, but uh, now that we actually are running Databricks on Google, uh, it's all even better still. So that's the quick answer. There's not much more to add <laughs> because it just works the, out the box. The Rust and Python bindings do not support Google Cloud Storage at this point in time. So yeah, the Spark, or I'm, I'm assuming the, the standalone reader supports Google Cloud Storage as well. Yeah, it's kind of um, just use Hadoop of uh, Google Connector yeah, to read gotcha. the table. But hey, we're always open to PRs now. To, so in case if Google <laughs> Cloud Storage is, you know, with the Rust API is something of interest, hey, you know, PRs, join us in the community. It'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, certainly that door is always open. One of the things like for QP and I, AWS is, is where we, we sort of live and work on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the only reason that the Rust and Python bindings support Azure is because someone that works on Azure showed up and, and worked with us to develop that, I think a guy named Ben, uh, showed up to help them develop the, uh, that. To date, no one's, no one's sort of joined 
join the Slack channel or, or, or join the project in any way to, to really get involved for Google Cloud Storage. So uh, if you want to learn Rust, we can definitely help you learn Rust to add Google Cloud Storage to that binding. So th this is an open invitation for everybody. <laughs> So, uh, all right, we have another question. This one's from the Zoom Q&A. So um, it's basically, is there any uh, prescriptive architectures uh, when you're moving your data from basically these transactional systems, like in other words, database type systems into Delta Lake with low latency, like 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, so that's the definition of low latency in this case. So different people have different uh, definitions of low latency. So this is their definition at least. Uh, <clears throat> with minimal data engineering. In other words, what's the, the least amount of code <laughs> that you can go ahead and uh, uh, to basically allow that type of uh, movement uh, uh, to, you know, to move that data from your transactional system into a Delta Lake? Yeah, I think Tyler has, can answer this question. Let's see how important. Yeah. So uh, there's there's work that's scripted uh, mostly by one of the folks on our data engineering team, the SQL Delta import, uh, which which Ryan's passing me that question because he's busy hitting the merge button, I'm sure, on that pull request. <laughs> uh, but uh, SQL Delta import, we, we developed because we're doing nightly imports from relational data stores into Delta Lake. Um, but because the question is really around, I, I would say something approaching a little bit more of a real time, I'll, I'll, we haven't done that yet, but I'll tell you what we were, we were thinking of doing. Um, so key in our architecture is Kafka for a lot of our streaming workloads. And we already have some tooling that's present to take, you know, messages, JSON formatted messages coming in on Kafka and insert each message as a row into a, a, you know, a configured Delta table. Um, this was the original inspiration for the Kafka Delta ingest project, which is now open source in the Delta Lake project. Um, so we already had the, the right side, I would say, of that equation where, you know, if we can get streaming data into Kafka, we can get that into a Delta table pretty easily. What we were looking at doing was deploying a tool called Debezium, which is D-E-B-E-Z-I-U-M, um, which you can connect to a relational data store to start streaming changes off of that data store. The reason we haven't done that yet is our relational data models are not so great. <laughs> um, there's not enough data engineering that's actually gone into those. So when we were looking at streaming data out of those relational databases, we were going to have to do a tremendous amount of transformation of that data anyways. So we, we actually shied away from it. But if you were to go down that route, I would suggest looking at Debezium, you know, Debezium, Kafka, and then something that takes data from Kafka and bring that into Delta Lake. Um, you can, I mean, a simple Spark streaming job can, you know, stream from Kafka and, and stream it into Delta Lake in like 25, 30 lines of Spark. Um, but that's the architecture I would look at right now. Awesome, there are thank also you very some much. some vendors yeah. that provide, you know, that database to Kafka connection as well. Oh, that's right. Good call out, Brock. Cool. All right. Uh, let's catch up because there's still a ton of questions. And uh, let me go back to LinkedIn before we lose those folks. <laughs> so we got a great question here. Does Delta Lake have versioning? And in this case, I'm going to presume data versioning. So let's go with that. Yeah, I can jump on this question. Um, so the, in Delta tables, like every single commit is essentially a version of the table so what happens is you know every you know change that you do it appears as kind of like a delta in the transaction log so that's also somewhat related to where the name comes from but it really isn't like where the delta name actually came from but you know these deltas essentially make up you know each version of your table so what you can do after that is um you know uh, you can compute the state of the table at any given version. And when you can do that, you can also just essentially go back in time, look at how your table was a day ago, a month ago, maybe even you know a year ago. Or you can you know just always query the latest version. So uh, it's kind of like a technique called, as I mentioned, like MVCC. Uh, and you know this allows kind of like 
you know, as new data comes in, you know, the readers that actually query the table, they don't have to see, you know, all the changes that are being made to the table in real time. What they can do is they can just like, you know, query the table at the version that they were, you know, they started the query at. So. Perfect. But this naturally leads me to the question, Barack, since you brought it up, why did we call it Delta? Okay, yeah. So the Delta name was actually quite interesting. I mean, um, it happened like uh, around kind of like New Year's time. And, you know, I came back to work and, you know, Tahoe suddenly became Delta. I was like, where did Delta come from? You know, I was like, uh, initially we were thinking like reservoir. But, you know, reservoir was both very hard to write and also hard to pronounce. Uh, but, you know, in the code, it was initially called reservoir. And then, you know, we were trying to come up with a new name for it. I was thinking of calling it a data basin, you know, close enough to a database, but it's like we're data basin, you know, you know, like more millennial style. Um, but, you know, in the end, like uh, one of our, you know, uh, members at Databricks, Jules, he actually came up with this name Delta uh, because, you know, the idea is, you know, you have these deltas that, you know, rivers flow into, and that's where all the sediments, you know, eventually, you know, uh, build up. And that's where, you, you know, and then, you know, once you, the stream goes into a delta, it splits off into like different streams. And, you know, you have this massive sediment buildup and that's where all your crops grow. That's where like most quality uh, you get from that river, you know, right at this like offset in this delta. So we thought, you know, that was actually a very nice, very nice, you know, like metaphor to think about, you know, kind of like streams coming in and, you know, like sediments and quality and, you know, it's kind of like controlled. And it also fit into our architecture of, you know, like you can have massive fire hose streams going in and then suddenly splitting out into, you know, like materialized views and things like that. So it felt quite natural. Awesome. No, thank you very much. I always love that story, dude. <laughs> All right. Uh, next on the line for questions. Uh, there is, I'll just answer this one real quick, but is there, um, how, how is Databricks, uh, no, that's not the one I was looking for. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, you know what? No, uh, let me switch to a different question. Uh, it's also on here on LinkedIn. Uh, how does um, Delta actually handle upsurge? So we, so we already talked a little bit about the merge. So let me, so I think we already technically answered that part of the question, but uh, like how far can you go back? Like in the, can you, for example, can you go back a couple of years of, the, uh, for, of your data if you wanted to? I mean, just, since you've, Brock, you already called out the MBCC portion. One, one would provide a little guidance on um, how far back in time, you know, based on size or maybe should we use some other alternatives, for example, uh, to compensate for that. Could you repeat the question? So, oh, sorry, sorry. kind of like upsurge with related to time or? Oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, I realized when I was looking at the question that we already answered the first part about upsurge. So this is just purely about going back in time, uh, that part of the question, which is like, how far back, oh, going in, back time in time could you go? Yeah, sorry, my apologies. Yeah, okay. Um, so regarding time travel, you know, like um, there's this kind of, um, I would say like inherent trade-off where, you know, like Delta will keep essentially all the changes that are made to your table as kind of like small JSON files. Um, but what it does is that it, you know, every 10 commits, it rolls up all the changes within those 10 JSON files and, you know, writes a massive checkpoint file, which is called, you know, is in part A, which stores the entire state of the table at that version. So, you know, there's this kind of like trade-off where, if your table is changing, you know, once every, you know, minute, um, you might have a ton of JSON files to read if you want to go back in time for essentially a year. Um, because, you know, for also cost reasons, we clean up some of the checkpoint files because these checkpoint files can actually add up to, you know, uh, quite a lot, you know, uh, quite large sizes. So, you know, if your data is changing once a day, then it's not actually that bad to go back, you know, three, five years. But if you want to go back, you know, uh, five years, but your data is changing every minute or every five minutes or every hour, it's actually better to have kind of like an archive table that can, you know, take your daily snapshots 
uh, from Delta and um, use that to actually go back uh, those three, five years, you know, if you need that for like regulatory reasons or whatnot. The, the archive table is a, is a really good idea. I would suggest on the Databricks blog, they recently posted some stuff about using the clone command. And if you're creating that archive table, the, the clone command will make that really, really easily. Uh, I wanted to, to briefly talk about what actually happens at the Delta uh, protocol level um, here, because there, if you're doing time travel, all you're really doing is saying you're picking a version in the transaction log to go to, and you're going to start to query from, from that. What that means, though, is that the Delta log has to have record of whatever data that you're trying to look at. And so if you think about you know, our, our use case where we're streaming data into a table, we're adding files, we're adding files, we're adding files. We might go in and delete files as well. The transaction log is going to have you know, add, 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 remove, add, add. And if I look at that, I can travel back to before or after the remove, unless I execute a vacuum, because the vacuum is going to come in and it's going to delete files. You know, it's going to basically, you know, anything that I've removed that I don't need anymore, it's going to get rid of, which is really good for that sort of cost uh, trade-off that Barack was mentioning. Um, so if you if you find yourself executing vacuums with some regularity, and, and in Scripps use cases, we do this uh, on, on some tables, you've got to be very mindful of what your time travel needs are going to be. And there you might need to do, you know, clone into an archive table on a monthly basis and then run your vacuum to clean up your, your other table, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we use, uh, there's a really uh, useful pattern that we use for streaming tables where we will stream data into a Delta table and then every night, because we're, we're, we're basically partitioning on a, a date stamp. So every single day we'll have one, uh, one partition of data. That night after a full day of streaming has been completed, we'll run a batch job that comes back to that table and we'll do a compaction, um, which I think is, I don't know if that's in, in Delta IO or if that's a Databricks only feature, but um, what the compaction will do is it'll create a new transaction. It'll say, here's the, you know, thousand little files that were associated with today, I'm going to create, those could really be most efficiently in four files. So I'm going to create a new transaction that is a remove, removing all those thousand uh, files and then adding four new files. And so if you're doing time travel, you don't want to go back to, you know, that day of inefficient, you know, where all those little files were, you want to go back to after we did the compaction. Um, so that your queries are, are, are working really well. Um, but again, there's nothing like, it's really gonna depend on the use case, I think for how, how efficient or how long you wanna support time travel. We've had some users request like, hey, I wanna go back to the beginning of time. <laughs> and we, no, <laughs> no, we're not gonna support that. We can give you certain time slices because you know, there's, there's cost trade-offs, there's performance trade-off that we've gotta make alongside that. And just quick follow Back to you, Denny. On the, uh, the clone. Creepy. The clone um, operation. Mm -hmm. There are actually two types of clones. One is deep and one is shallow, um, because the we, we actually keep track of the files using the transaction log. If we do a um, shallow clone, it's actually really cheap. It's really just cloning the pointers. We don't actually copy the data. But if you do a um, a deep clone, that's where you keep get uh, copy all the data as well. And so a a deep clone will not be impacted by vacuum. Uh, operation that Tyler mentioned. But, so let's say if you want to maintain a specific snapshot of the table forever, um, you, you go with the, the deep clone instead of the shallow clone. Yeah, shallow clone is really useful for like development, I found. But if you're archiving, I think deep clone is definitely the right call. Excellent. Uh, we've got some pretty awesome stuff and a good shout out to cloning as well. <laughs> so, um, all right, well then, actually, I think this naturally segues to another question. I think it came in, I'm actually forgetting where it came in from now, I apologize. But uh, this is when you're doing machine learning, actually, does it make sense to use Delta Lake? Anybody like to chime in on that one? No, oh, I, I can talk about kind of like the integrations that Delta has with MLflow. So MLflow has this um, auto logging feature where you know, it keeps track of like which models you're training, um, you know, which algorithm you're using, which hyperparameters you're using to tune you know, uh, your you know, model with. And you know, as part of this auto, -log auto logging feature, you know, when you're querying a Delta table, it'll also keep track of which version 
your delta table, which version of your delta table was used. So, you know, MLflow can track all these, you know, experiment data, you know, in its server. So, you know, you don't have actually have to have a CSV file or Excel sheet on your local laptop, which, you know, only you can see and no one else can see. Um, you get all this information and uh, you can also reproduce these experiments with the exact same input parameters. And um, so this really helps, you know, uh, customers, you know, both develop their machine learning pipelines, you know, run these experiments, see the results, see, you know, the best performing model. And then, you know, one thing that they can do is, you know, sometimes, you know, you want to push a model to production. Um, you want to keep that reference data set, you know, for next year. For example, you're, you know, uh, running a model for like Christmas time sales or, you know, like uh, uh, Black Friday sales, right? So you want to see next year if you can perform better. So what people do is they can actually archive that version of the table using a deep clone as well. And, um, and then, you know, next year when they add more features, when they come up with like new techniques, they can go and hit that archive table instead and um, see how their model performs, you know, apples to apples instead of, you know, this year's data may be a lot different than, you know, last year's data, so. I think that's Excellent call it. it's also um, a good place to do, to store a large amount of features um, or a large amount of training data, especially if you want to do a, lot, a large scale distributed training or distributed inference, that the table is definitely a really good um, choice for where you want to store all the data and input. Excellent, excellent. And so, hey, uh, a couple comments or call outs actually, I'd like to add to this. So one is our friend Andre, he wanted to call out the fact that with respect to machine learning, uh, Delta MMOflow actually allows you to reproduce an experiment with the exact same data, which is exactly the, uh, the call out here, right? Because one of the things that's sort of being called out here by, uh, by everybody is this context of data drift or model drift, right? That data changes over time. And with that, your model itself might change over time with it. If you're not aware of that fact, what ends up happening is that your model is not going to be as, um, uh, uh, will work as well because, well, the underlying data had changed and you haven't retrained or modified or uh, updated the hyperparameters according, right? So having the original data so you can reproduce the experiment and then you can go ahead and figure out how to um, adjust accordingly to, well, you know, get a, uh, do a better job with it. The context also is, is, and I think Michael's the one who actually mentioned this in a couple, uh, couple of blog posts or videos, is that underneath the covers of all this is that in order to have good machine learning, you have to have good data quality, right? And the reality is with Delta Lake, you're actually able to do that. You have a transaction that protects the data as it's coming in. You pr you're preventing corruptions. You ensuring the schema of your data is valid. Right, so you're not going to have uh, uh, the wrong columns with the wrong data types coming in. You, you're, you're able to ensure that the quality of your data is extremely high. Having that allows you to have better machine learning models, right? And so a lot of times you don't think about that. And it's understandable, by the way, because most um, non-production environments are, I download a file that has every, all the data clean and it's easy to go ahead and run your, your models. In, in production, in real world scenarios, your data is dirty. Like And so ensuring that quality using Delta Lake actually allows you to have high quality data, which means you have a better model. So anyways, that's me getting off my uh, soapbox on that one. So. And, and just adding um, to what Barack mentioned uh, earlier, in the traditional um, world, you have to make the trade-off between, do I want to go batch or do I want to go stream, right? With Delta Lake um, tables, you actually, you can start with batch um, ML pipelines and eventually move to a stream, streaming ML pipeline um, without changing the underlying data store and to get a better, you know, um, latency on how you want to compute all the other features and inference. So that's also a really good plus for using data tables. Rock on, rock on. No, thank you very much, QP. Okay, so a uh, couple more questions before we call the day. Uh, but we have a great question from LinkedIn concerning uh, how does Delta Lake actually handle schema uh, enforcement and schema evolution? And then a subsequent question to this also is that like, it, is there like a maximum of number of columns involved as well? And so um, to anybody here in the panel. Yeah, I can answer this. So basically, Perfect. 
for basic schema part, basic every time when you write when you write to a delta table, we will make sure the data you write is compatible with the schema we store in the transaction log. So we always store the table schema in the transaction log as the truth. So we don't use the schema in Parquet actually. So this means we can also support like a schema evolution. You can add new columns. Like uh, you, for example, in the second day, you may add new columns. And uh, this column doesn't exist in the Parquet files. And the, when we read back, we will feel like a null values. And then for you, this is how we support the schema evolution. Perfect. Thanks very much, Ryan. Uh, anyone, anybody want to add anything else before I switch to the next set of questions? Yep. On top of that, Delta also supports check constraints. So for example, to keep kind of like your data quality, you know, as high as possible, you can say that, you know, hey, my timestamps cannot be more than five years ago because, hey, I didn't launch any software more than five years ago. Or, you know, um, <clears throat> basically you can define these like SQL expressions on your table that, you know, make sure that, you know, your data is, of the right format of, you know, it's been parsed correctly. It's not, you know, garbage essentially. And then what Delta does is that, you know, as it writes the data, it'll perform these checks and, um, you know, reject the data if it contains bad records. Excellent, thanks very much, Brock. All right, cool. Uh, next question here. Um, there is a, um, it's more of a generic question, but I think it's still quite valid. So I figured I'd ask it. Uh, uh, this is from the Zoom chat. It's like, um, have you like work in production? Have you ever implemented a streaming pipeline um, with Delta that processes hundreds of thousands of transactions per second? It, it seems like it's a, it just basically trying to figure out, can you do it for something like fraud detection uh, with very low latency and high transactions per second requirements. So I think it's, uh, so yeah. I was actually go. seeing and, this question. I was, I was hoping we would talk about this. Um, yeah. I can just tell you like Script, Script has some data pipelines that are pushing the between 20 and 30,000 messages per second coming through these, these streaming pipelines. And what we have learned thus far is that our limitations tend to be around fine tuning batch sizes uh, in those streaming pipelines, but also constraints on the driver node. So we've actually, for, for some of these workloads, we've actually had to launch multiple Spark streaming jobs that are uh, effectively identical, but they're, they're basically taking a subset of the, of the stream so that we're not overwhelming the driver node uh, for that streaming cluster. I'm very curious to hear from Barack. Like I'm sure, I'm sure from Databricks stream team, you've seen a lot bigger customers. But uh, we've had like pushing pushing tens of thousands of requests per second through Spark Streaming has been a learning experience, I think, <laughs> for everyone involved here on uh, on figuring out how to tune and and work with Spark Streaming. So I'm curious what you've seen, Barack. Yeah, I mean, among our customers, it's actually not uncommon to see you know. Um, workloads that reach, you know, a million to three to five million records per second, actually. Um, so it, it's a matter of, you know, um, the latencies, though, to get, you know, that amount of throughput, um, you might want to think about in the latency of order of, <clears throat> you know, 15 of seconds or, you know, almost a minute. I would say. So if you're okay with kind of like a minute, you know, latency, um, you can kind of hit those, you know, a million records or, you know, 3 million records per second. If you can also scale out kind of like your executors really well. And, um, you know, we, you know, these pipelines have typically been, you know, pipelines where files land on cloud object storage systems. And, you know, it, it has been very well tuned to, actually maximize the throughput from these, you know, file object stores. So it's not possible. It does take a lot of work um, maintaining, you know, and, you know, if you're fine with kind of like a minute latency, that's possible. Um, I've also seen some like Kafka pipelines where we were able to get, you know, like 1.2, 1.3 millions of records per second uh, with structured streaming as well as Delta. 
Um, but again, you know, you need to realize that you're essentially writing to files, then you're reading back from the files, you're, you know, paying this cost of like serialization, you know, parquet serialization, parquet deserialization. And then, you know, is that good enough to, you know, send an alert around like fraud? You know, if it's okay to send a customer, you know, a minute later, hey, we detected this transaction from your credit card. Um, is this okay? Then, you know, tell us no, and then, you know, we'll take action or something. If that's fine, yeah, you can definitely go ahead. If that, you know, if you're looking for something like, no, I need to do this, you know, like within the second, you know, Kafka to Kafka, run something. Well, you know, then Delta doesn't come into play here. It's like, you know, you're just going from Kafka to Kafka at that point. I'd add that um, if you're doing if you're doing high latent or low latency, you know, uh, high throughput uh, streams, I would definitely look at how you can instrument the Spark streaming jobs for your own analytics needs. Um, like, you're not going to get the stuff that you might you might want out of Spark UI at that scale or that. Uh, that high latency. So what we've done, QP actually wrote a blog post about this. We integrate Datadog with our Spark streaming jobs so that we can pull some of those metrics out uh, into Datadog so we can observe the, the different service level objectives for some of these streams. Um, but you you to get that low latency, high throughput, you'll definitely have to spend some time thinking about what your instrumentation strategy is going to be with the, the streaming workloads. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Okay, I want to cut short just because we only have a minute left before we are we are done. So uh, for starters, I want to say thank you very much for everybody for uh, for me, uh, for speaking at today's panel. Really appreciate your time. To all you folks, I apologize for not getting to all your questions. We had a lot of questions coming in from all three different. Uh, um, uh, venue, so it's hard to keep track of all that, so my apologies. Uh, but if you do have any more questions, don't forget to join us on delta.io. That's the Delta Lake website. At the bottom, uh, or just click on community, you can find us on the Google Groups. You can find the Databricks YouTube channel. Um, you can also find us our, on our Slack, so you can talk to us through that way. So uh, again, so Please go ahead and join the community. Continue the conversation. As you can tell, a lot of us love answering questions. So by all means, go ahead and talk to us there. Uh, so uh, again, apologies for not tackling all your questions, but you can find us there and you can berate, uh, you can certainly berate me at least there, okay? Uh, and then um, uh, uh, one more call out for the Data and AI Summit. Uh, don't forget that we're all gonna be there. So again, so you can chime us there, you can look us up, you can talk to us that way obviously virtually. Uh, and then don't forget, uh, this Thursday, there's also a bunch of really cool community lightning talks. Uh, so be on the lookout for that and join us there. All right. So I think that's it for today. Again, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time. And um, you all have a good one. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye.